Yeah, so today I want to tell a few things without really getting too much into details about RCD KN spaces. No? Because as, as of today, as of, I guess, Monday, we only we have only uh, dealt with CD K infinity spaces and um, the corresponding RCD notion. Um, and given that I want to say, well, I mean, uh, even the lower reach bounds uh, are important, uh, for, especially from the geometric perspective, when they are coupled with an upper dimension condition, you know, uh, I have to discuss this topic. Um, and before doing that, I want to uh, make a comment about optimal transport and the concept of non branching. So, uh, definition. So, a geodesic space, this is just a metric space, forget about uh, CD, RCD, whatever, just a geodesic space is non branching. Uh, if uh, uh, this never happens, you know, you never have Y shapes. This never happens. These are geodesics. Never happens. That is to say, uh, if, uh, you know, given gamma one and gamma two geodesics, if, uh, uh, you know, they're extreme, on, say, on defined on the same interval zero one, as usual. If the restriction to some non trivial interval zero a, whatever, of gamma one is the uh, same. Nicola, uh, sorry. Yes. That this black word is pretty dark. Uh, it's usually uh, the one that you're writing on, it's usually better lighted. Uh, okay, let me try think, playing with the, with the lighting. Yes, see. Uh, there's a light on. This the thing, so like the lab, the bar of the this? That like, yeah. That's better. That's better? Yes. Yes. Yeah, sorry, I don't know. Um, well, this is this is better than before. Uh, but, but can you read this better enough? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, you can, or, or yes, it's better if I go and seek help uh, from the fields. Uh... Uh, no, I think I can read it. Uh, I'm not okay. sure. Maybe Eric I also have the impression in. that these lights are getting, uh, you know, uh, lighter and lighter. This one, that it, it looks, it looks very good to me. I think there could be two issues. First, the actual there's physical controls for the. In this up, maybe it gives a little bit more. <laughs> I'm doing my best, Eric and Vitaly. I'm sorry. That's good for me. I can I can read it now. Okay, great. Um, so um, what I was saying. So so I was speaking about the definition of being non-branching. And non-branching means that if you have a, first of all, it's a definition that is given for geodesic spaces, and uh, and geodesic space non-branching. If the following happens, whenever you have two geodesics that agree on some non-trivial interval, your a is bigger than zero then the two geodesics are actually the same. So this never happens. You see that you have two geodesics that start at the same and then they branch, okay? Now, if you do optimal transport of metric spaces, this non-branching is something you will tend to hear a lot because of the following fact. That it is a theorem, but uh, I have no time to prove it. So let me give it as an exercise. And anyway, I will not use it at this point. The same is also, by the way, so this is the same. You can read it the following way. So uh, let me, you know, equivalently, equivalently, um, um, if uh, the map, uh, you know, if you, you take the space, let's call geo X, this is the space of geo D6 on X, you know, this is a subspace of, you know, cars on zero one. And, um, uh, and you can consider on GX the map from GX to say uh, X squared um, that takes uh, gamma and returns uh, gamma at time zero and at time t, you know, uh, for uh, for any t in zero one. This map over here is injective. It's 
another way of, of, of saying it. Yeah? Well, let me let me elaborate on this. Um, uh, or equivalently, or if, or if, and equivalently, and equivalently, if the map from G of X to the curves, say, on zero T for, you know, Uh, if yes, what? T is strictly between zero and one. Strictly between zero and one. I come. I, 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 it's correct. I, I convince you in a second. Let me just uh, write this. It takes the visualistics and visualistics and returns simply its restriction to the interval zero. That's you know, is it is, it, is it injected. Okay. Injected. No? I mean, this is really a rewriting of what I said, you know, of the definition of non-branching. You know, the restriction map to some non-trivial subinterval, uh, to any non-trivial subinterval, in fact, is uh, uh, is injective. And, and this is the same because you know I, I don't really need to look at the entire subinterval. I just need to take to take two points, one initial point and one middle point. Why? Say that you have two geodesics that agree on two points. So I don't know, I have something like this. So this is a geodesic and this is another geodesic. Okay. Well, but then the distance between this point and this point, you know, is, is you know, this length is the same as this length, basically. Therefore, this guy is also a geodesic. You see, by triangle inequality. And therefore, and therefore, if we start from two geodesics that only have, you see, you agree? This is, a, of course, it's important that this is, a, that this is an intermediate point uh, because, as you mentioned, you can have even of manifolds, and manifolds are certainly an example. Uh, I mean, the prototypical example of non branching space, uh, uh, you can have judices with the same initial and final point. But this is the matter of what happens you know, inside. Okay. All right. Uh, now, the exercise is the following. Now, you know that in optimal transport, uh, you know, a, a typical issue, a typical problem is understand whether there is a optimal map or not where there is a uniqueness of plans and typically uh, you need you know a lot of assumptions on those uh, you know say on rd you want to deal with a certain cost function the um, initial measure should you know give zero mass to suitably uh, small sets and etc cetera, etc cetera. but with non-branching you have the following beautiful and general result so let x be non-branching And uh, say mu t uh, a w two geodesic. Right? And also, so this is a metric space, so these are just measures. And let's pick t between zero and one. Then for every s in you know the closed interval, uh, there exists a unique optimal plan from mu t to, to mu s and it is induced by a map. Right? The problem with this theorem is that it's useless, but it's look very cool. Okay, so it's useless because typically you, you never, I mean, you typically you want to describe edge of E6 from its starting point, not really from intermediate point. But, but uh, you know, it's incredibly powerful. And uh, let me try to convince you that something like this could be true. Okay, the line of argument for this theorem is the following you take an optimal plan and you prove that that optimal plan is induced by a map. If you do so, then the optimal plan must be unique, right? Because otherwise you could take the convex combination of the two plans induced by these two maps, and this would be a new optimal plan and not induced by a map if the map were really different, okay? So how can this be true? Well, basically the idea is the following. So imagine you have, so this is mu zero, mu t, mu one. And, uh, Suppose that you have an optimal plan, say from UT, let me pick S equal one. I mean, if, if you can do the job for this, you can do for everything. Uh, and, and suppose that there is some point, you know, uh, um, 
you know, which is being sent to two different points, a little bit here and a little bit here, right? Well, but then this point should also be sent, you know, somewhere. Uh, we can go into Museo, say just to, to one guy. And then it's a matter of checking the optimality condition to realize that this curve should be a geodesic and this curve should also be a geodesic. Okay, which is exactly what is being excluded by the number engine assumption. All right. Now, as I mentioned, the typical example. Uh, the typical example of non branching spaces is a Riemannian manifold. And in fact, this, I mean, if maybe you don't remember, but I've mentioned, I've been mentioning this uh, um, when presenting, uh, you know, the curvature, uh, the, the curvature condition, the CDK infinity, uh, on a Riemannian manifold. Actually, let me say, let me say like this on a corollary of the exercise, if XD is non branching and uh, and uh, let's say x dm is a cdk infinity then and uh, uh, then let me put this way um for any uh, say t maps to mu t, let's say curve uh, of measures uh, with absolutely, uh, you know, a continuous, I mean, absolutely continuous measures, uh, geodesics, W2 geodesic. And pi lifting of it. We have. Uh, the following inequality uh, uh, log of rho t in gamma t is less or equal than one minus t log of rho zero in gamma zero plus t times log of rho one in gamma one uh, minus k over two t one minus t distance squared gamma zero gamma one. Uh, this is all true. I should be careful with the quantifiers. So for um, uh, pi, almost every gamma, uh, this is true for almost every. Uh, or maybe for every t, this is for every t, this is for every t, and this is for pi, almost every gamma. What it is, this inequality, this inequality is the one such that if you integrate it, you get the convexity of the end, the, end, oh, the convexity of the entropy. Right? Makes sense? If I, if I integrate with respect to pi, right? Huh? Because you know, the integral of log rho t gamma t d pi of gamma, right? This is uh, here only gamma t appears. So this is the same as integrating. Uh, this is the same as integrating log by the you know definition of push forward log rho t in d et push forward pi. Right? But this is mu t. So um, we are really integrating, you know, rho t log rho t dm, right? Which is the entropy. And this works for t equals zero, t equal one. And if we integrate distance squared gamma zero gamma one using the fact that pi is lifting a geodesic, what we get is really the optimal, you know, the W2 square between mu zero and mu one. Okay. Now, I hope you see that now that this is way more powerful than the just the convexity of the entropy. Because convexity of the entropy tells you that, you know, some convex, some integrated convex inequality holds this is telling you that you look the integrands are you know are in a certain you know convex uh, convex relation okay um so this is just way more powerful by the way so how can we uh, you know prove this result well uh, there are you know there are first of all there are a couple of observations that are worth to be made perhaps related to this corollary well first of all is that if the if you have an unbranching space which is cd 
Well, then you have the convex inequality along any W2 geodesic, not just along some of this. How can this, how can they, how can this be the case? Well, take an arbitrary um, is a consequence of the of the of of this uh, of this exercise above, because take an arbitrary geodesic mu t, and uh, and now say, look, uh, let me pick you know just a, a small t but positive, and let me apply and let me notice that because of this exercise there is only one geodesic from mu t to mu one. There cannot be two. If you want, because this is the optimal transport analog of this picture over here. Okay. Or if you want, if the space is non branching, uh, the space of measures built on it is also non branching. So you have a uh, unique geodesics from intermediate points. Certainly not, you know, you can have cut points like in manifolds, but once you start going a certain direction, then, you know, you must follow it. So if the geodesic is unique and the space is CD along that geodesic, you must have, you know, the Curvature condition, right? But now you let t go to zero by some continuity or over same continuity statement. You get you get what you want. Okay. So first of all, you have a, you have a, you know a geodesic convexity is in place for you know along any along any geodesic. Uh, here, this for every for any pi lifting of the given geodesic is also cheating, because whenever you have a, a non branching space, the lifting is unique. Okay. Um, uh, again, it's a it's a consequence of, of what of what we were saying about how you can have how could you have multiple multiple liftings if you have you know the same marginals the same marginals okay if you should play a little bit with the definition you see that this is the case. But now basically you are done right because in order to deduce this uh, what it is that you do I think I've mentioned some uh, discussion this direction in the Riemannian setting if. Uh, because what it is that you do, you can say, look, pick your pi lifting of, of your, you know, of your, uh, uh, of your, uh, of your, uh, of your mu t, and notice that for any, for any set of curves, uh, what is uh, c zero one x, you know, Borel with uh, you know positive measure with respect to gamma. Um, um, uh, you know, I can uh, take the restriction plan, which is just pi restricted to gamma normalized. This is a, now this is a probability measure. Now, now by you know by optimal the support of this plan is including the, this. Yeah, the support of this plan is the, is including the support of this plan. Therefore, if that guy was a lifting of a geodesic, this also is, it must be a lifting of geodesics by you know the fact that. If I, you know, if I pick a plan with support, uh, optimality is uh, preserved, and uh, and therefore the map that takes t and returns e t push forward um, pi gamma. This is uh, is a W two geodesic, right? Now this is a W two geodesic, and therefore the entropy must be convex along this geodesic because we just said it must be convex along any geodesic. Okay, and uh, and uh, moreover. Moreover, what I know, so you know, uh, so what I'm telling here, um, I want to say that this convexity, the 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 so and therefore you know and therefore uh, the entropy uh, is uh, k convex along it. And um, I want to say that this k convexity is the same. As uh, the convexity you know, as, as this integral in some sense. Uh, sorry, the, uh, in the pi. Okay. There is only one thing that I should pay attention to, which is which is the following. If I want to say this, that what what I what I need to say is the following: is pick uh, pick. Let's call this measure I don't know mu t gamma. Okay. And let's say that it has a density. I mean, it certainly has a density, which is uh, which is uh, let's say rho t gamma. Okay. And now, and now, here is an important question: Is it true that rho t? I mean, and and this is the density that appears in in, in computing this entropy. I mean, whereas there, I was that that inequality is written with respect to the density of the original plan. Okay. So so here there's. There's a, a you know a caveat I should pay attention and wonder whether this is true that rho t gamma 
at some you know uh, point gamma t along along the geodesic is the same or not of rho t gamma t up to maybe some normalization constant up to you know uh, i guess up to this normalization constant um of this for you know for a geodesic gamma that belongs uh, to to our set of gamma I should be a little bit more careful with the almost everywhere, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, an, an identity of this form should be true if I want to, you know, uh, really say that the convexity of the entropy here is the same as the integrity inequality. Okay. But this holds again by the non-branching assumption. The non-branching assumption is telling me, is telling me this. It's telling me, look, uh, pick, let me draw a picture. Pick uh, you have this uh, this uh, plum pie that gives mass to some geodesics, and then we have the evaluation map e t, and here you know I project down and have mu t, and then I look at a small region over here, and uh, and I wonder and I wonder um, and and sorry no and, and then I say the following I pick. I pick a subplan. I pick just say a few of these geodesics. I look at the image of this, and I and I get a submeasure. Okay, and now asking whether whether this identity holds basically amounts to ask the following question: Pick a point if you want, or a small set here, you know, where where I am looking to the measure mu t gamma, and ask yourself: Is it possible? That some mass is being given to this point by geodesics that are not green. Because in order for that to be true, I really want that all the green mass, you know, all the mass of, of the original measure, of the white measure that is sitting in the green region, uh, should come from green geodesics. Make sense? But this is granted by the non branching assumption once again, because the non branching assumption tells you that ET is injective, you know, once. Is zero it is injective. You have some injectivity at this level. Okay, makes sense. In fact, it is telling. It is telling. If you want, let me put it this way. Uh, in by a map, yes, and uh, yes, and let me put it this way. And if pi is a lifting, then for every t strictly between zero and one, uh, you know the map. E t from the support of pi to x is injected. Once you restrict dot to plans, you don't even need to pick to pick uh, your know, initial points. Okay, and this injectivity is what is telling you that here you don't have overlapping of mass. Any, in some sense, the mass that is even that is given to any given point comes from only one geodesic, and because of this, you have this sort of identity, and therefore once once you have this k convexity, this k convexity is the same as this integrated inequality. But once you have this integrated inequality for any gamma, it is a matter of measure theory to, in some sense, to conclude that it must be true at a point to s level. Huh? Once the set of gammas for which this inequality fails must have measure zero because otherwise integrating on it, we will find it. Right. Okay. Very well. Now. It is a theorem, deep theorem that solved, you know, a long conjecture that has been proved by uh, Ching Den uh, here at Toronto, by the way. So he was a student of uh, Vitaly Kapovic, that finite dimensional RCD spaces, in fact, are non branching. Okay. Uh, I won't prove this theorem, this is very hard, uh, but I will rather mention a way easier result, uh, but still deep, uh, that has been, that has been, Proved by Rayal and Sturm. That tells, okay, uh, that basically tells that, you know, from the perspective of um, CD and RCD business, maybe these RCD spaces uh, are possibly branching, I don't know, but they are essentially non branching. So if you put the appropriate almost everywhere in some sense, uh, claim where needed, uh, they, they act as the non-branching space. Okay, in particular, uh, this the conclusion of this corollary is true even in the setting of RCD spaces. 
and uh, and uh, uh, let me give uh, let me give the definition. Ah, I don't have it. Um, yes. Um, definition. Um, and now this is a definition of you know uh, of, that is tailored to metric measure spaces. If so, uh, for every pi, um, uh, um, uh, you know, this is a probability measure you know, as usual on the space of curves, um, with which is which is with bounded compression, with uh, so um, uh, bounded, uh, you know, et push forward pi should be less or equal than some constant uh, uh, times the reference measure for every for every t in uh, zero one and some constant c and uh, pi optimal geodesic plan and pi you know optimal geodesic test plan optimal geodesic geodesic so this means that you know the total energy if you want coincides with the squared distance between the you know the initial and final marginals Or if you wish, that is the same as saying that uh, you know pi is uh, a lifting of a of a geodesic. Okay. We have that. Uh, we have that. Uh, um, uh, let me put this way: the map um, and for every t strictly between zero and one. The map et, uh, you know, uh, is is pi in what that goes from you know this space to the space of curves to x is uh, pi essential injective. Okay, what does it mean, pi essential injective? Uh, pi essential injective means well that you can that is injective if you restrict it to a set Borel set of you know with complement is uh, pi negligible. Okay, it's you know is as injective as it can be from the from the perspective of you know pi. So it's it's really an analog uh, at least of this conclusion over here, you know, except that we are not asking, uh, uh, first of all, we are not asking for actual injectivity, but just for essential injectivity. And we are not asking this to be true for any uh, optimal uh, plan uh, pi, but just basically for those uh, with bounded compression. So here the measure, the reference measure M uh, comes and plays a role and plays a role. Uh, sorry, question? Yes. Uh, I thought the definition was that uh, this negligible set should be the same for all c that you can remove i don't think i don't think this is the case i'm not completely sure i think this uh, is I, I, this is not equivalent uh, i was i thought that that was the definition <laughs> okay am i the wrong <laughs> i'm being recorded don't let me so i think that this is the correct version i think i think um uh this should work so I, i'm more, so let me put this way i'm more confident with this okay uh, of course of course of course if the set uh, is the same for every t uh, yeah that, that, that's formally a stronger statement yes if, uh, assumption it again uh, what i'm saying is formally stronger assumption than what you are saying yeah exactly 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 uh i think so i guess the point is this i think i'm able to prove this and uh, and this is sufficient for all the purposes you know for the, all the applications of this condition um so i may appear with this it okay. might be that you are right but i'm not fully confident about this can we agree? Uh, that's fine yes okay <laughs> um anyway i will not give the, the the proof of this of this of this theorem so um 
of the actually of uh, the theorem that I still have to state. And uh, and here it is and here it is. And uh, so the theorem, which is a powerful result by the Yaren's term. Tells the following tells that if you know x dm uh, is rcd k infinity, then then uh, uh, well it is essentially a branch. Right. Which is well, first of all, it's an inter is interesting as a statement because it, it deduces an unbranching assumption out of a curvature condition. While up to you know a couple of minutes ago, it was sort of morally going in the other direction. Uh, let me just quickly comment on how you know that can ever be possible uh, without giving the details that are actually quite complicated. And the the idea, the rough idea for the proof, is to start recalling. That given that we have RCD condition, uh, then we have the EVI property for the gradient flow. And therefore, we have from EVI, we have that the entropy is convex, um, is K convex uh, along any geodesic, all W2 geodesics. Okay. Now, imagine that the space was not essentially non branching. Then you could have a situation that, qualitatively speaking, now I'm being you know, a bit rough, the actual proof requires a careful estimate. But the idea would be imagine that you have many geodesics in the branch, also along an optimal plan. Then maybe you would have a situation like this you have a, you know, a vast time geodesic. That it starts, say you have a major say on a ball or somewhere that's set. It starts moving uh, for a while along, along geodesic, and then this geodesic branch. Okay. Then, uh, then uh, you know, uh, some geodesic go in this direction and some geodesic go in this direction. Okay. So far, so good. Now, where, where, uh, what is it that the problem arises? Well, the problem arises when you start noticing that okay, you could restrict now your your given plan to you know the green geodesics. And this would be, you know, again, an optimal geodesic plan. So you would have a convexity of the entropy along, along this plan. But you could also do the same for, you know, a, a red a geodesic. Okay. And this would also be a convex. Uh, uh, convex. And now, and now, and now here is the problem. Now, when you combine these two, there is a, a crucial difference in what happens, you know, on the left part of the geodesic. And on the right part of the geodesic, because in the left part of the geodesic, when when you add up the entropies, you know, coming from green and coming from red, you don't get the entropy of, of the full measure because the entropy is not you know, not linear; it's super linear. You have, you have an ad, you have an additional log of two that appears from the side. And whereas here on the right on the right hand side, on the right hand side, you have you have you have something which is let me put it this way. So you have imagine imagine you have this. Uh, you have uh, two convex functions. They say a green convex function and the red convex function. Okay. Now their sum, uh, of course, is still convex. Okay. And their sum is a, is a you know let me put it it's a yellow uh, convex function. And uh, on the you know if this is one half time one half, you know after time one half or after you know after when did you so. The, the, the graph that you are seeing in orange is exactly the graph, uh, uh, the, you know, of, of the entropy of the initial geodesic. But what is now the entropy, you know, uh, before, before one half or before, you know, a little bit before one half when all these things are together. You get uh, the sum of the entropy plus an additional log of two that comes from, from the nonlinearity. So, so now you have something that, you know, if you just look here, the, the left hand side, this is convex. On the right hand side, this is convex, but here you have you have a discrepancy of log of the order log of two. And now, how can you know this thing be convex? See, given that you can you can in some sense shrink this interval, you know, as small as you wish, provided you pick, you know, a smaller uh, you know a smaller set of geodesics so that the separation is going to occur, uh, uh, you know, in a, in a shorter time. 
you basically have a jump of, of order log of two, and that and that you know destroys any a priori convexity that you might want it to have. Okay. Now the actual proof is you know more complicated, but you know that's that's the uh, basic rough idea. Beautiful idea. Okay. So this is essential number range, and uh, and a consequence of essential number range. I mean, if you have that, and you follow the argument that I very vaguely um, uh, pointed out before. You can conclude that on essentially non branching spaces, this curvature condition can be localized actually along the disk. So, so a corollary, a corollary, you know, if x, if uh, x, well, let x be m be RCD to infinity uh, and pi be an optimal uh, geodesic plan. So the lifting of a geodesic, or if you want an optimal plan living on the space of geodesics, with uh, uh, say absolutely continuous marginals, uh, then then you know for every t we have the inequality that I guess I uh, erased. So log of rho t gamma t less or equal than one minus t log rho zero gamma zero plus t times log rho one gamma one minus k over two t one minus t distance squared gamma zero gamma one. Um, this holds for uh, pi almost every gamma. So we can localize along geodesics our curvature assumption, which is morally what you would have loved to do from the very beginning, but you cannot state the curvature condition in this form because otherwise you don't get stability. Right? Okay. Um, so, in that sense, that's enough for what concerns for what concerns uh, RCD K infinity uh, spaces. Uh, so, what I want to do now, maybe after after the break, is to introduce these uh, uh, finite dimensional versions. Uh, so in part of the CD condition, so in particular the CD, CD star and CDE, the entropic version. Um, perhaps let me just uh, no, let's let's do the break now and then then I discuss yes the modified sign function later on. Uh, five minutes of break, better four. Okay, and see you soon. Please, sorry, there was a question. Please, sorry. Question the break. It's on the break. Yes, it's on the break. So we don't lose time. Yes, yes. It's officially the break. So we resume in four minutes, 30 seconds, please. <laughs> I have to do a lot of things. I want to give an plan of splitting before handing. Yes. 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 Not so true. So you have an uncountable number of times, right? Yeah, but they can, if you start with the continuous function, they can say that Let me think. So you are saying, uh, if you are non-branching in the sense that I that I presented, then you should also be non-branching in the sense that Kapovich was mentioning. That, that is, you can actually find one set. Of full pi measure on which this is, uh, uh, and the proof is you pick a countable that you know, all rational times, you pick the associated set of full measure, you take the intersection. And now you're telling that if you restrict ET for irrational T to this set, this should still be uh, injective. And why is that the case? Uh, it doesn't go the, on the other, on the wrong direction. No. <laughs> Is not injective? Gamma. Yes. Of gamma is the same of ET of gamma tilde for T, which is irrational. Yes. What is Q complement? Uh, um, I mean, maybe, maybe it could be different for. Uh, Uh, 
there is also some subtlety that I always, you know, I always have an headache when I, when I think to this. So I'm 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 sad, I'm happy with it with it, with this condition. The the something that could that could be is that you know you could have a set of judices that in principle has you know positive pi measure, and what it happens is that you know some of these branch at time you know t, some other at time t prime, some other later time, and so on and so forth. So the whole set has positive measure, but whenever you look at any given time t. Um, those that branch at the time are, are actually zero. And I'm a little bit confused about, about uh, this sort of, of behavior. And, um, but you know, the definition that they give, I mean, this theorem is correct. And it is sufficient for the purposes of, uh, of, uh, of uh, localizing, of getting this corollary, which is what, where I want you to go. All right. Alternative is proven by using some the so-called useless theorem, uh, I think, uh, in adaptation of this theorem. So when you assume not only non-branded, so when you when you assume useless something greater, ah, only depends on the activity for sort of if, if not, then so it's it, it, fine. So maybe it's not that useless. That's one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it could be, it could be. Um, I'm not so sure. It could be. So to be honest, uh, I thought about this a couple of years ago. You know, I brought down some notes uh, for myself, and now I'm referring to these notes. But, but not really. I don't have all the details in mind. I um, I'm happy with this. It could be that an equivalent uh, that in fact it implies an a priori looking stronger looking statement. Mm, I don't want to you know make a clear uh, uh, you know statement because I'm not so sure. Okay. Ah, I forgot. There was one thing that I wanted to tell. I forgot. I should prove. Uh, sorry, the commutativity of the heat. Well, I'll do this. I'll do this at the end of the lecture. At the end of the lecture, I will. I will. Uh, you know, there was a missing step uh, last. Uh, last actually, let me give you last lecture. Um, I will. I will do this later. Uh, all right. Um, let me go to CD, CD star, CDE, and then all the relatives. Um, now, when you do comparison geometry. You should be acquainted with the concept of, you know, generalized sign function. So, in some sense, it's uh, quite unusual that um, I'm presenting them to you today rather than in the first or second lecture. My excuse is that I'm an analyst, not a geometrist. So, uh, so for for k real, let's define uh, uh, the generalized sinus function. So, S k. This is a function that goes from, uh, you know, well, let's say, from R to R. Uh, and this defines as the only solution of second derivative of SK plus K times SK equals zero, subject to the condition. So at, very, at time zero, we are zero. And I guess the derivative at M1 is one? Yes. Right. Of course, when k is equal to one, your function is sinus. When k is minus one, is the hyperbolic sinus. And when k is zero, this is just the identity. Okay. And so these are convenient ways in terms of incorporating uh, all of these uh, in, in, into one. So when, perhaps when k is positive, uh, uh, you should think as sk. I mean, not you should. Sk is really is really what is one over square root of k sinus of square root of kt so that's and then the same analog uh, with the hyperbolic uh, sine and cosine all right now uh, this function is in some sense the starting point for elaboration of our interpolation coefficients and our interpolation coefficients are the following um now for now for parameters k in r n between one and infinity, but now let me say you know that n is finite. Um, and d is our distance function is not negative, and time, which is between zero and one, with all these parameters, we define you know sigma k n t of d. This is 
um, uh, sinus of you know coefficient distance squared k over n at time t divided by sinus coefficient distance squared k over n at time one. At least you know this is basically the definition. The only thing that I basically want to pay attention to is that when k is positive, when k is one, let's say I don't want to look at the sine function beyond the, uh, the point pi. So I want just to look, you know, where, where it's positive. And this has an echo in the definition of this coefficient. So I'm saying that this, I care about this if d squared k over n is less than pi squared. Uh, otherwise, it's plus infinity. You know, but for all intent and purposes, just pick this formula and forget about, you know, uh, whatever things that can go wrong. So what is this guy? So why, why do we care about this guy? So this guy is the only solution of uh, the second derivative plus distance squared plus distance squared k over n f equals zero subject to the condition f zero equals zero and f one equal one. So it's just, you know, I'm picking that sinus and I'm just putting coefficients just in order to be sure that this is what happens, okay? Very well, but why should we ever care about anything of this form, especially if we are concerned with uh, uh, lower Ricci bounds? Well, the point is that in the model space, you know, the sphere of the appropriate dimension, uh, RD, or the hyperbolic space of the appropriate dimension, uh, if you look at the, at the Jacobian determinant of the exponential map along a geodesic of length D, that determinant satisfies exactly this. Possibly with uh, okay, possibly with a different value at time one, but the ODE satisfied is exactly this. Okay, and now the Ricci curvature, so the Jacobian determinant is controlling how, in some sense, how the volume measure changes along the six, which is exactly the kind of thing that should be controlled by a lower bound on the Ricci curvature. So, in some sense, a lower bound on the Ricci curvature tells tells that the yeah the the measure is you know more. You know, at least, well, let's say entropies are more convex than on model spaces. So this sort of Jacobian determinant come into play, very roughly speaking. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, in some instances, we also need to use uh, what CEO called uh, the torque coefficients. And the two coefficient is a is a the big brother of the sigma coefficient. And the two coefficient is the following. It is given by the same parameters, and the two coefficient at time t k and d is nothing but is nothing but the following. Uh, well, up to you know suitable exception when uh, the dimension n capital n is exactly one or something goes wrong about this inequality. But basically, the, the torque coefficient is this: is you take t and you raise to the power one over n, and you multiply by the sigma coefficient with the same parameters. The same right? No, uh, k n minus one, sorry, uh, d, and you raise it to the power n minus one over n. Um, all right, so first of all, when k equals zero, two and sigma are the same. Because when k equals zero, the sinus function is just the you know, identity function. So, so also sigma is just d, and then it's just t, I mean, and then, and then you, you get a sigma, all right? Um, in general, what this torque coefficient is doing is, you know, you remember what we said about Jacobian determinants in the model space. Well, rather than looking, so if you are concerned about, uh, you know, lower each bound by K and upper dimension bound by N, well, perhaps you should not look to the model space with dimension N and lower bound rich K, but you should look at the model space with lower rich bound K, but dimension N minus one. And notice that the, you know, you feel the rich curvature, you know, uh, you don't feel the rich curvature in the direction of motion, 
okay? This has to do with the fact that in, 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 the, in, so in Riemannian geometry, uh, there is a trivial solution to the Jacobi, to the, equa to the equation of Jacobi fields. And that is, you know, if your starting point, if either your starting point or your starting derivative is uh, as the same direction of, of the speed of the judice you're moving to, then you just have trivial solution. You don't see the curvature in this direction. Okay. So, so when sometimes, sometimes, it might be helpful, you know, to keep this in mind when speaking about lower Ricci bounds and say, look, when I see the curvature, I really see the curvature in my orthogonal direction. And if I have dimension n or dimension upper bound by n, then I really see the curvature in just in n minus one directions. And so that is what I should use to compare with uh, this comparison. All right. That's the philosophy, then there are computations to be done, but that's the philosophy. So, so in, the direct, in one direction, you don't see the curvature. And that's, you know, taking the number of this. In the, all the n minus one direction with the, you know, even scaling, you see the curvature bound. Okay. All right. We are ready to give the definition of CD, of CDK and space. I'm sorry, I have to erase this you know, beautiful uh, definition. Oh. And these are definitions that have been given uh, by Sturm, okay? Uh, the sigma and tau coefficients have been introduced by him. Uh, Lot and Villain in some sense only uh, treated the case uh, where uh, either k is zero or n is infinity. And in that case, as I mean, as you have seen already in infinity, but you know, the case k equals zero is easier, as I've already mentioned. Uh, you, know, you don't need these more complicated tools. But I mean, just that. Okay. Okay. Here is the finish. C, D, P. Well, so X, D, so X, D, M is, you know, C, D, K, N is so. If uh, for every uh, mu zero, mu one, um, uh, well, let me say absolutely continuous with respect to M, with bounded support, let me add, bounded support, uh, there exists uh, pi optimal geodesic test plan. Uh, not as a uh, plan, you know, connecting uh, the two. So E0 push forward pi is uh, mu zero. E1 push forward pi is mu one, uh, mu one. So that writing uh, ET push forward pi as rho TM plus uh, some singular part, well, you know, um, sorry, mu t per uh, this is mu t s and equal mu t s s stands for singular. This is perpendicular to m. You know, writing this, we have that minus the integral of. Uh, um, of rho t to the power one minus one over n prime divol dm. This is less or equal than minus the integral to one minus t, one minus t a n prime distance gamma zero gamma one rho zero to the power one over n prime and gamma zero plus two by time t same distance so let me write the form and then i comment row one to the power one minus over n prime in gamma one d phi of gamma and this should be true for every uh t t in uh, uh, zero one and for every n prime greater or equal than n. All right, so um, 
what is this well first of all let's have a look to this sort of function over here on the left hand side this is what is called the Rainy entropy function you can see that if you correctly renormalize it and rescale when n prime goes to plus infinity this goes to the entropy to the entropy. I mean, if I send them prime in this formula to infinity, the, the you know, uh, this just simply goes to one. So there's, there's nothing exciting. But if you do something like, uh, you know, the interval of mine, what it is, uh, minus, I guess, what is x, uh, z, let me see, z to the power one minus one over n plus z multiplied by n, something like this, uh, this should go to z log z. Okay. And uh, so here uh, you could, I could add plus the interval of rho t, which is morally one, because morally is it? So I'm morally adding so nothing. And then a rescalation, I could multiply this inequality by n uh, by n prime if I want. So to make this more evident, but we'll make the formula more complicated and given that it's already complicated enough, you know, let's just keep this in mind that the any entropy, so this sort of integral is a finite dimensional version of the Boltzmann Shannon, and let's be happy with that. That's the thing. Uh, the, the, the singular part does not play any role, whereas, uh, whereas for the Boltzmann entropy, right, uh, if the measure had a singular part, the entropy was plus infinity, right? Why here are we just throwing it away? Well, it has to do with the shape. I mean, this is in sense the correct thing to do from the perspective of calculus of variation. It has to do with the fact that the exponent here is smaller than one, okay? Imagine, imagine, that, you, imagine that you approximate a, a direct mass with a uniform distribution over a small ball. And uh, let's do, let, and look at what happens at this rainy entropy or, 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 or at the Boltzmann entropy, right? So let's, let's have a look at this. So if, you, if you don't have experience with functionals of measures, this example uh, should be uh, quite illuminating. So let's say, let's say that you have, you know, mu r is just the reference measure restricted to some ball of radius r centered at x, normalized. So measure of the ball to the powers minus one. Let's compute, let's compute the Boltzmann entropy. So what it is the entropy you know, that we have used as of now of this mu r? Well, it should be you know, the integral of uh, you know, um, density log, log of the density. So the density is uh, uh, what well, m of the ball you know, to the power of minus one, log of the density, uh, so which is, well, but there's a minus, and there's a log of uh, you know, m of the ball. And this should be integrated basically on, you know, I mean, the density is zero outside the wall. So I, I just integrate over it, right? Now, so, so integrating, this is a constant. So integrating over here, I get, you know, this gets simplified. And this is minus log of the measure of the volume of radius R. So this goes to plus infinity as R goes to zero, right? Or as the measure, you know, goes to zero. And this is, is an indication, if you want, if you don't want to, you know, give me too many details, but it's an indication that, you know, perhaps if the measure is a singular part, the correct value I have to put to the entropy should be plus infinity. Because whenever I approximate it with the most regular thing that I could possibly be, which is the uniform, uh, with the, I mean, the measure with the uniform density, you know, in a, defined on some neighborhood of the support, what I get is plus infinity. Okay. Let's see what happens in the same case where I have a something, uh, you know, which is which has an exponent less than one. So here, the, the crucial part, the crucial point here is that the function z log z is a superlinear, okay? And what remains after you know having calculated the, the, the density is just in terms of the excess in linearity, if you want. Right? So let's see what happens in the same case, but if we integrate, you know, again, of course, over the same ball. Uh, the density to the power one minus one over n. So I have uh, the mass of the ball to the power one minus uh, one over n. Right? Um, with, there's a minus in front. Uh, with the second, I mean, I'm a little bit. No, sorry. Um, the dense, sorry, the density is uh, this to the power minus one that we, uh, um, you know. This okay, so this is you know again this is I get a minus one which gets simplified by the fact that we integrate over the set. So this remains minus the measure of the ball of radius r to the power one over n. Right, 
So again, it's just the, you know, the difference from the linear part in some sense. But now, you know, if this goes to zero, this goes to, if this number goes to zero, I'm raising it to a positive power, this goes to zero, okay? So in some sense, this justifies why in computer this rainy entropy, we are not, we are not looking at the single part, okay? Justify, I mean, it's an informal justification for the proof, the proof it will be, you know. Uh, I guess the correct statement is, you define, first of all, you define the rainy entropy just, or Boltzmann entropy, just uh, on measures that, that have no singular part, just as the interval of the density. And then you extend that to the whole class of probability measures by taking the lower semi-continuous relaxation with respect to weak convergence. In one case, you pay plus infinity whenever you have a single part. In the other case, you just forget, okay? And that depends just on the behavior of the, okay. Very well. Now, what, what about here? Now, the CDKN condition is not, is not a condition about, strictly speaking, it's not a condition about convexity of the Rennie entry. You know, the CDK infinity is morally easy in some sense. No, it's just the entropy is k convex. I have judicial and dynamic. This is not like that. It's a bit more complicated. And uh, although it looks like some sort of convexity, because now let's have a look to this right hand side. Uh, it is the sum of two things that are, you know, really symmetric. One is, you know, at time zero, the other one is at time uh, one. Let's have a look to, the, to this quantity over here. And notice that if there was no such guy over here, this integral integrated with respect to pi would be exactly the Rennie entropy of, of mu zero. Okay. But here I'm paying a distortion coefficient that depends on how long this geodesic is traveling. Okay. And, and then there is the symmetric guy that there is a symmetric guy at time one. So it's a bit more complicated, but you know, the concept is there. Okay. Um, all right, that's the formula. One last comment. Why for every n prime greater or equal than n, why don't we just ask uh, this for n? Well, that's a good reason. Uh, the reason is that a priori, it's not clear, given that we might have branching of judicic and so on and so forth. It is not clear whether the validity of this for some n implies the validity for all the n primes bigger than that. And, you know, among other things, you would like this, CDKN condition to have some natural, you know, inclusion. So if you have a space which is CDKN, you would like it to be at least, you know, CDKN plus one, for instance, right? And so, and that's, on the other hand, it's also useful in terms of, uh, you know, some inequality that you might want to derive to be sure that you have, you know, convexity, you know, for any guys. And, uh, and of course, sorry, a theorem, theorem, storm, a Riemannian manifold satisfies a CDKN if and only if the rich curvature is greater than K in the dimension of the zero dynamic. Of course, the meaning, you know, uh, that has to be there. Otherwise, we are, we are speaking of nothing. Okay. I want to make evident how lazy I am. Let me now give the definition of a CD star condition. A space is CD star if blah, 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 sigma, sigma. Okay, that's the only difference between the two definitions. You just use the sigma coefficients in place of the two coefficients. Uh, theorem, storm, a space is CD star, a Riemannian manifold is CD star if and only if uh, it is, it is, uh, uh, there's lower bound on the Ricci by K and upper bound by N. In particular, or Riemannian manifold CD star and CDKN are equivalent because they are equivalent to this, you know, tensorial version of. Um, let me this. Um, there's some easy relation, uh, or, or I mean, conceptual ease. Maybe then the computations are complicated, but you know, it's just numerology if you want. Uh, uh, that the following is true. So there are some basic uh, relation between CD and CD star. Let me let me point this out. Yeah. Uh, so theorem. So the CD star condition has been produced in a paper by uh, Sturm and Bakker. And uh, uh, so uh, theorem. And if you want, this is a uh, Sturm Bakker. Bakker Sturm.
Um, so the CDKN condition implies a CD star KN condition. So if you are CD star for some positive K, then you are CD with a slightly worse K. And the same. Eh? Um, so in particular, in particular, but this is evident from the definition of sigma and coefficient, in particular, CD star 0n is the same as a CDKN. So the difference is only really felt to, sorry, the difference is only really felt to when the curvature bound is not zero. And last, but certainly not least, CD star KN is equivalent. Uh, well, uh, yes, is equivalent. Uh, no, in, let me say implies, implies, there's some, there's some implies a CD lock. And we'll mention in a second what is CD lock. K prime for every K prime strict is more than K. What is CD lock? It means that every point has an eight root such that the CD inequality holds if your starting and ending measures have support in that neighborhood. Okay, then maybe the geodesics go a little bit far from the neighborhood just because the neighborhood maybe is not convex, but certainly not too far because there must be geodesics. So, okay. All right, then, okay, so here's the question. Why did Sturm bothered about, you know, defining also CD star? One, you already had the CD KN, already had the equivalence uh, with, uh, with the Riemannian case. And the reason, the reason is that it is easy to see. There's an easy, there's an easy, um, also perhaps, um, uh, so uh, on non-branch, if X is non-branching, is non-branching, let me add here, is non-branching, I mean, it's, uh, in Bakker's too. Uh, then um, uh, CD star lock, KN implies, C D star K N. So the star version of the curvature admits a globalization theorem, at least under some you know non-branching assumption that you can regard as a technical assumption. Okay. In fact, uh, this has been extended also to essential non-branching spaces. I don't remember by whom, but uh, there's a better theorem in a second. So I will. Okay. So so. Of course, I mean, when you define, so Sturm had a few problems when define, in defining, uh, you know, uh, these lower, uh, these lower Ritchie bounds. One was the stability, one was the, you know, uh, the compatibility with the Riemannian case. But then there are a number of questions that, uh, you know, uh, you would like, you know, a number of natural properties that you would like to expect any curvature bound to be in place. And one of these is locality, right? So curvature is a local quantity in Riemannian geometry. So you would like uh, also, also your synthetic version of curvature to, to be, uh, you know, uh, localizable. So if I only look at small portions of the space and I look that in each of these portions, the, I have the lower bound on the Ricci curvature and upper bound the dimension. Can I conclude that my space is CDK? Okay. And, uh, and, uh, and this, this kind of statement is important because you cannot, you know, for stability purposes, uh, CD star lock or CD lock, they are not stable. Okay. A priori, if you don't have a globalization, because because you could have a sequence of spaces, each of which is CD lock. You wonder, but in some sense, the locality is only true in smaller and smaller neighbors. If you are not able to integrate these inequalities, then, then you, you get nowhere. In fact, is the, I mean, the whole point of this convex inequality is to integrate no, a, differential, uh, a differential property, right? But if we, if we just integrate the small neighbors without being able to enlarge these neighbors, we are basically stuck almost where we were starting from. All right, why this theorem is easy? Or, I mean, so frankly, this theorem is really easy. I mean, once, once you write down the, you know, the non-branching, uh, you, you understand uh, the, so, so if X is non-branching, basically you can take out the integral from this inequality written for the sigma. Much like we could take out the, you know, you know the integral from this, okay? And, and once you take out the, so, so, so the integrals, basically what you end up with is an inequality regarding, uh, you know, the density of your, of your interpol of the, you know, the measures along the geodesic. 
and this density are you know convex in a sense that is related to the sigma coefficients okay why then this convex inequality can easily be quite easily be generalized and it's not the case this for the tau coefficients well the reason is that the sigma coefficients they do solve an ODE. that's the basic that's the basic point while the tau coefficients they do not there's no such a simple OD which is satisfied by tau coefficients so the sigma coefficients of the OD. so in some sense this means that if you are uh, you know if you, if you are let me put things so perhaps this is easier in the in the, in the you know uh, for convex function so uh, the fact that the convex function you know means hessian uh, non-negative uh, uh, is implies that you can recognize a convex function by looking at you know small interval this is convex you know uh, small, and as far as the function is finite you know being a convex on uh, on a cover uh, implies convexity on, on, on the global on the global scale okay and this is kind of the same phenomenon because being sigma convex, I mean, being more convex than what is, you know, um, enforced by the sigma coefficient is something that you can check locally because the sigma coefficient satisfies a certain ODE. I'm very rough, but that's, you know, the, at the bottom line, at the bottom of the argument at, at, at this point. Okay. Um, all right. So are we, so, okay. But then we have CD, CD star, that's some relation, but CD star is also, I mean, all these conditions are all stable basically by, the same argument that we've seen for the for the CDK infinity condition. There is no additional complication at that level. So we have condition. We have two conditions. Both are stable. Uh, both are uh, you know compatible with the Riemannian setting. One has the better property of being globalizable, at least under you know some non-branching assumption. Why don't we just stay with CD star and forget about CD? Well, the point is that, and this has been a point, an important point for a long time. In uh, um, geometric and functional inequalities, uh, Lichnerowitz, spectral gap, you know, some, uh, I think even Bonne Myers, if I'm not wrong, and so on, CD gives the sharp constant. CD star does not. CD star sometimes you get, either, rather than getting some, you know, coefficient k, you get k multiplied by n over n minus one, or vice versa. I mean, something that goes in some sense in the wrong direction and pays off the fact that you forgot one, you know, one. Uh, uh, you know, you didn't use the the fact that in the smooth case it's true that you don't feel the rich equivalence in the rectal motion. So, so quiff constants are sometimes a bit off. So, what do we do? Uh, this has been, you know, a, a, a you know a huge problem in the theory for like ten years. No, maybe more, more than ten years. Until uh, um, Cavaletti and Milman, uh, they have been finally able to prove that CD is equivalent to CD star, at least. Uh, uh, at least under some you know, so the theorem, the beautiful theorem by Cavalletti. This is the globalization theorem. This is if you want me, Emilman is Emmanuel Milman. If you want, it is the analog of Toponogov's theorem for lower reach bound in the synthetic setting. Uh, so they the statement is this so if uh, uh you have a space which is cd uh, i guess well cd star cdm and essentially non-branching um actually essentially non-branch essentially non-branch um and with a finite mass then you know it is uh, uh, CD here. Hmm? So you can view this as a globalization theorem because CD star is basically equivalent to CD lock. So if you have CD lock, you get the glob. Okay. So there is this assumption of essential non branching, but as we look, so at least. If we care about the R uh, CD version of this statement, thanks to Surmar Yara, this is not an issue in some sense. So this theorem is, you know, among other things, I mean, if we, are, if we are extremely in some sense unpolite, we can see this result as a result that you know clarifies clarifies the taxonomy of CD spaces. They are all equivalent. Yes. Okay. Of course, there's more than that. I mean, <laughs> it's not a matter of nomenclature; it's a matter there's a theorem about you know this rich curvature bound that can be globalized. Okay, uh, this assumption is you know widely believed by anybody in the fields that is actually not necessary. 
but nobody has ever actually written down the proof. So, you know. Ah, okay. I didn't know. Okay. Finally. Very well. Very well. Great. Great. The technical reason why this is present is because this proof is strongly based on disintegration techniques and disintegration theorems, uh, you know, it's easy to disintegrate. I mean, standard disintegration theorems is about uh, probability measures. Uh, so, you know, if you want to go to infinite measures, you have to be a, a bit more careful. Uh, but I mean, if you, well, anyway, I'm glad that somebody is being, is writing, is writing down the full, the full version. All right. So why did I, you know, mention all this and, and just didn't just, you know, speak about CDK and end and of the story? Well, for two reasons. First of all, because if you read papers or you go to conference about rich equation bounds, you will for sure hear CD, CD star and whatever. And I want, you know, uh, this to be clear to everybody. And second, because in fact, the fact that, you know, this globalization theorem for CDK n, which is basically this theorem is an important theorem and I didn't want to sometimes overlook this result by, you know, not mentioning a little bit of the story. And uh, okay, so um, so that's one thing. And there's also another reason because, in fact, so now if I want to go to RCDKN, I need to include to introduce a third variant. And the third variant, uh, and this has been introduced by Edward Kuval and Sturm. And the third variant goes like this: is the CDE. And the CDE condition. This is an interesting. In some senses, I mean. Uh, the personal comment, it's a pity that it did not come out sooner because I think it's even simpler to describe. Uh, it does not involve uh, a Rainy entropy function. It just sticks to uh, relative entropy. And, uh, and um, um, well, uh, stars, I think that, the... let me start with the following uh, definition. Say that you have a function from zero one to R, and uh, and I say that this is uh, uh, by definition is uh, not k. So we have seen k convexity, right? So k convexity is some bigger than k. Is say is k n convex if uh, so convexity means that in some weak sense at least the Hessian of f um, is greater or equal than k, right? That that's what k what k convexity is. Now um, k n convexity. Means that the action is bigger than this plus something which is positive, which is the differential of f tensor, differential of f divided by n. Okay. Of course, when n is plus infinity, this reduces to the classical convexity, but it is you know, a stronger form of convexity. Um, now, notice that uh, this is if you put, I mean, this is just again numerology, if you replace f with uh, what it is minus so let me define capital f as minus exponent of minus one over nf then this uh is equivalent to um the hessian well let me call it fn the hessian of fn to be uh you know plus k over n f n to be greater or equal than zero. Let me notice that this looks suspiciously close to this. Okay, okay now now that we have this. Let me raise this. Uh, um, now that we have this, um, um, but uh, by the way, so this is, and, and in fact, and in fact, this is also equivalent to the following inequality. Uh, Fn of t is less or equal than sigma one minus t kn. Um, actually, let me uh, so let me put this way. Um, 
So let me. Uh, um, let me think. Yeah. So so if let me put it this way. So if if uh, let me put it this way. If gamma if a gamma from zero one to a metric space X is geodesic. And, and then, then the map T to Fn of gamma T is, uh, uh, you know, uh, satisfies, uh, satisfies uh, uh, star star. If and only if, I mean, I can write this. This is a convex inequality, so I can integrate this inequality. And the integrated version of this inequality is this: is f n gamma t is less or equal than sigma one minus t k n f n gamma zero plus uh, sigma one minus t. Uh, sorry, I forgot. Sigma should take also distance. The distance would be gamma zero gamma one f zero gamma zero plus the symmetric guy again i do understand that seeing all these uh, coefficients is confusing and i want to you know assure you it remains confusing even after years of of studying in this direction so it's just just what it is uh so but let me point out this so um uh, yeah, so first of all, uh, as I mentioned, this is differential inequality that admits an easy integrated version. And if you, integ if you integrate this version in some sense that, you know, uh, it plays some role, if you want, this sort of the, 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 the speed you're moving with. So if I'm in a metric space, so, so, so the distance between gamma zero and gamma one appears, and this is just, you know, uh, you know an inequality, okay? All right, now, definition, definition, Erbar Kuvada Sturm, Erbar Kuvada Sturm. Uh, if I have a X DM is a so-called CDE KN space, where E here stands for entropic curvature dimension, if, the functional, uh, um, let me put it this way. So the functional En of mu, which is, uh, you know, minus exp of uh, minus the entropy of mu divided by N is Kn convex. Is Kn convex. No, in the in the vast sense, in the vast sense work in W with respect to W. So again, what does this mean? Let, let me not don't let me write the, the full definition. This means that for any two measures with finite entropy, so with where well, this is finite because the domain of finiteness is the same, there exists a W2 geodesics, a W2 geodesics, along which you know. Entropy at mu t is less or equal than sigma huh? plus. Uh, uh, okay, so one of the advantages of, of this of this of this uh, uh, definition is that now okay, let me actually let me write. So you you what you get is an entropy of mu t less or equal than sigma one minus t k n w two between the mu zero and mu one entropy n mu zero plus the other term. And now you see this is a real inequality for the functional En, whereas, whereas here there is, it's not really a convexity of the entropy, you know, because there is a, this mixture of tau and sigma that are, that are in the, the same. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, of course, one of the first thing that they prove is that for a Riemannian manifold, uh, this uh, is, um, uh, you know, uh, equivalent to curvature dimension condition in the classical sense. And uh, the interpretation is that whereas, uh, you know, the, a lower Ricci bound 
is you, you can be interpreted as you know uh, the Hessian of the entropy bigger than you know k times the identity. A curvature dimensional condition can be read as uh, uh, you know formally, a formal way. The rigorous version is uh, you know okay. And uh, why is this relevant for us? Well, this is relevant because of the following thing. Well, first of all, first of all, it's a is a is a is a in some sense is an easy theorem, is an easy theorem that if x is essentially non-branching, non-branching. Then uh, uh, C D star is the same as C D E. Okay. It's not easy that they are both C D, that, that's Cavaletti Milman, but in some sense, both these conditions that can be read through ODEs in some sense are equivalent. Okay. And why are they equivalent? Well, because in both cases they reduce to the validity of this inequality without without in some sense the interest. Okay, because under this non-branching assumption, you can you know localize, and once you take out the integrals and look at what happens point-wise, these two inequalities are really the same. So in some sense, CD star and CD are two different versions of integrating that inequality. Okay, but they are equivalent once you can disintegrate them. Um, all right. Um, now, uh, let me perhaps now here is the, and of course, once you have this. I mean, okay, now now here is, uh, well, I need to erase that. Let me erase, uh, okay, here is this. Now, of course, each of these definitions comes with the R version. We just add the imputation of the And uh, if you want, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that Herbert Kowal and Strom did was to, in fact, realize that uh, uh, the easy it is easier easier to deal with R C D E, okay. The thanks to to this result is the same as R C D star, if you want. The thanks to Cavaletti Milman is anyway the same as R C D. Okay. Um, the theorem that they proved. Um, okay, there, there are various. Okay, let me first of all, let me state the most important, I think, result, and then I will detail give a couple of details. So uh, the theorem is the following: so uh, x uh, is uh, you know R C D E K N if and only x d n if and only if the following four conditions are true, and this, as you will see, will be extremely reminiscent of what I wrote last time. So first of all, the measure of the ball of radius R centered with X is bounded by some constant E to constant R squared, you know, for every R positive, given X, you know, given X. Two, the sober to Lipschitz conditionals. I won't rewrite it. So whenever you're a sober function with weak upper gain divided by one, it has a one Lipschitz representative. Three, it is infinitely my Burton. It is my Burton. And four, the Bokken inequality holds in the following version. So for so for RCDK infinity, we had the following condition. So for every what was the F um, uh, in the domain of the Laplacian with Laplacian of F W one two. And G non negative, uh, uh, G was in L2 and in L infinity with Laplacian of G in L infinity. Uh, so for RCD, the inequality was in terms of Laplacian of G grad or D F squared over 2 dm greater or equal than the integral of G. And there was grad F grad Laplacian F plus K times grad F squared. This was, you know. If I close the parenthesis, close the integral, this was you know, the theorem that I presented last time with n equal infinity. What they basically they proved is that here, RCD EKN 
enforces this inequality with a positive term in the right hand side. Okay. And this is, you know, in, in the Riemannian setting, this is, you know, perhaps I should mention that in the Riemannian setting, a curvature dimension condition is, you know, characterized by the validity of this inequality. And this is just the, you know, the weak version, the way to write that in, in our setting. Okay. How did they prove this? Well, the scheme of the, well, did I prove this result? Yes, I did prove this. Well, at least I proved one implication in the n infinity case. And, uh, and the scheme was the following. Uh, you start in the RCDK infinity. If you are RCDK infinity, then you have the heat flow. This heat flow satisfies the EVI. The EVI, let me actually, let me write it here. So you had, uh, you know. I mean, basically, it's the same scheme. What I want to say is the, is the same scheme of the proof, complicated by the fact that you know here, you know, formulas are more complicated, and there are also technical issues to be dealt with. But the scheme of the proof was this: so RCD, you know, k infinity. This implies, uh, you know, if you want, uh, if you want, this implies, yeah, implies the e, an EVI k condition for the gradient flow of the entropy. This implies, among other things, implies the contractivity, no? the W2 contractivity of the heat flow. And this implies by duality a Bakri Emery estimate. And this implies, you know, by differentiating a zero Bochner inequality. All right. So at least this proves, you know, well, plus, of course, there is, okay, this proves just four in some sense. Three is part of the definition, and there was one and two somewhere else. But if you want to prove the finite dimensional version of this result, one, two, and three, you already have the point is just proving Bochner. Okay. And, uh, and one of the things that, that um, Herbert Kowal and Sturm did was to realize, uh, I mean, this one of the reasons why this definition is useful is because it comes with, you know, an analog of, of this, uh, of this um, uh, well, I don't write the format anyway, it's too late. So uh, uh, RCDKN implies an AVIKN uh, formulation for the, uh, for the gradient flow, where you don't differentiate, you know, the AVI was a differentiate distance square from a given point, and this satisfies some, some inequality. And uh, what you can replace is you differentiate not distance squared, but some trigonometric function depending on the, some sigma, some sinus you know, function of, of the distance. And, and uh, you know, with, you know, one has to be careful with the parameters. And here you have not this, but you have a, you know, a more elaborated uh, contractivity estimates, which, which, which is better. Actually, let me, write, let, me write at least, let me write at least the contractivity estimate for the heat flow. And the and the finite dimension of Bakri, um, um, yeah, Bakri Emery estimate. These are these are good to know anyway. So along the proof, in some sense, uh, they they obtain this. Um, uh, okay. Uh, Okay, the quantitative estimate is, in fact, it's a bit scary. Let me write it anyway. Uh, so it tells that I k over m of one half w two mu t mu t squared. This is less than e to the sorry mu t mu s. In fact, one feature of the EVI kn is that the contractivity that gives works even for different times, whereas for our contractivity of the gradient flow, we only had, you know, the distance between what was nu t and nu t. No, not nu t and nu s. You get nothing better than from triangle in a cold But well, here you get something better, which is minus k time uh, s plus t. S k over s is our, you know, modified, uh, you know, modified function, modified sine function. Yeah, you have mu nu, nu, if you want this, to the power two. And then you have a plus and so plus 
n over k times one minus e to the minus k s plus t. Okay, square root of t minus square root of s square divided by two s plus t. Uh, this might look ugly, but let me just notice that this implies the following uh, a bit weaker statement, but still stronger than what you would get from from e to minus k times ten to the right of yes w two mu zero mu zero plus two n one minus exponential minus k two divided k times two square root of t minus square root of s squared over two s t is by definition just two over three t plus square root of t s plus s i guess so this is not easy to read it's certainly not easy to read but in, in particular if you take T equal s, you get exactly the, the, the inequality that you had before, where n disappears, even here. But, you know, but this is better, okay? And perhaps it is more interesting, uh, the Bakri-Emery contraction estimate, because that is really, in a sense, a more differential inequality. And um, let me write it here. Um, And the back emery contraction estimate is the following. It tells that the differential of HTF squared. So the, in the, the, the infinite dimensional version was this, right? The final dimensional version adds a positive term over here. And the positive term is plus 4k t squared over n times e to the 2k t minus 1. And here I have a Laplace of ft of htf squared. So I get not only a pointwise control on the gradient, but also a pointwise control over the Laplace of, uh, of the, my heat flow, depending on the dimension. And of course, as n goes to plus infinity, uh, this goes to zero, as you know one would expect by Reality. Okay. So, so you know, yeah. So, so you have to understand how to interpret the EVI through this uh, KN convexity. Then you have to understand which sort of contractility property this implies. Then you apply Duada's Kuvada duality's principle to get the Bakri Emery estimate. And from this, you differentiate the time zero, and you get and you get uh, the Bokken inequality. Okay. And the vice versa, where well, I didn't say that much, not even in the case n equal infinity, but in some sense, all these implications can be, you know, uh, reverted with a non trivial work. Um, let me just conclude this, uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, lecture by pointing out that uh, uh, Ambrosio Mondino Savare uh, proved basically the star version of this uh, theorem. Um, the rest is really the same. Uh, using not really, not really, um, uh, so, so Herbert Quad and Sturm, they, they, you know, the KN convex function was not the entropy, but this modify entropy, so X of minus one over N. Now, if you, if the gradient flow of that function is nothing but the heat flow, but you know, flown with a different time parameter. You know, if you if you the grade if you post compose a function, uh, the gradient of phi composition f is nothing but phi prime times the gradient of f, right? So in some sense, in flowing in flowing this modified entropy, you are still flowing the heat flow, but with a different you know time parameter. So the flow is still linear, among other things, because the heat flow is linear thanks to infinite member can. What uh, Ambrose Modine and Savare did instead. What they studied the gradient flow of the Renyi entropy. Okay. Or there's, uh, you know, uh, which is not linear. Uh, and the Renyi entropy is not really convex because the CD 
star condition is not really convex you know it, there's this strange integral so but still uh this gradient flow has some sort of contractivity property that can be dualized to some sort of uh Kuvada, uh sorry some, by Kuvada can be dualized via some sort of Buckley emery estimate that the differentiated gives uh, gives the uh the book inequality okay uh so this came a couple of years later uh the, again the backbone of the proof is the same technical details are very different because you know the functional to be used uh is uh, is, is different but still the picture is the same you can determine libertarianity gives some evi some sort of evi condition evi gives contractivity contractivity is by duality by creamery and by differentiating book all right so that's the end for today what I will do on Monday is I will speak about distribution on Laplace and we'll speak about, you know, Laplace and we'll do geometric analysis, seriously, in finite dimension. So we'll see that, uh, you know, the distance on a CD or an RCD space uh, has a Laplace or upper bound, which is sharp and is useful to prove the splitting theory, among other things. Um, yeah, uh, that's it. Sorry, End of the lecture. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I thought it, it, you still wanted to prove um, that heat flow commutes with Laplacian. Yes, in fact, I was saying to, I was going to say this. So I that's the end of the lecture. Now there is an addendum, which is which is the you know what I was not what I had to prove from the, from the previous lecture. But you know, if I, I, if I didn't say this sentence, I would have felt guilty because my lecture should end at eleven forty. Strictly speaking, I guess right. It's already eleven fifty-five or whatever. Uh, so now let me put this. So there, there's there's an easy remark and then a technical one. The easy remark is the following. We know that given f in L2, um, you know, the map that takes T and returns H to F is a gradient flow by definition, is a gradient flow, you know, is a gradient flow of our Chigar energy. And this means, among other things, that dt of HTF is equal to the Laplace of HTF. And let's say that I don't, I know nothing about uh, regularity of gradient flow. This at least is true for almost everything. Okay. All right. Now uh, let's have a look. Now let me fix. Uh, say, uh, what should I fix? Uh, say S. And let me look at the map. Let me put S. Let me look at the map that takes T and returns H T plus S. Over. Okay. Well, you know the heat flow is a semigroup by uniqueness of, of gradient flow. This is both H T of H S F and H S of H T F. So this is also a gradient flow starting not from F but from um, H S of F. But so still satisfies if you want. This satisfies D T. Of ht plus sf, this is equal to Laplace of ht plus sf. Okay. As of now, it might seem that I earn nothing, but in fact, given that this is also hs of htf, and given that hs as a map from L2 to itself is linear and continuous, it commutes with derivatives. So this is equal with hs of dt. HDF, right? So what I gain out of this is that you know for almost uh, you know so this is now equal you know by the previous point this is equal to HS of delta of HDF. So what I know in a sense for free without uh, using any sort of regularity or well, beside this is that for any S, what I know is that for almost every T, I mean if I compute this and I compute this, I get, I get the same result. Okay. Now, what I want to do, I want to send t equal t to zero under the assumption that f that f as a, as a Laplace in L two. Okay, and how can I do this? Well, uh, I think the from from the perspective, there are various ways of doing this. You can uh, you can either rely on the theory of linear semigroups, or you rely on the theory of gradient flows. Okay, given that I, you know, I adopted the gradient flow, you know, approach in this course, let me, you know, start with this, uh, emphasize the second point of view. And, and the, the remark is the following, is that, 
Okay, this is true for every uh, convex function, but uh, convex and reversible continuous function on the nearest space. But this slope, you can compute. So the chief energy is a function over there too. And therefore, you know, I can define the slope. And the slope is actually equal, is actually equal to, um, um, actually, let me put this way. So for, for let me put this way. So for any convex and lower semi-continuous energy on an inverse space, the slope at any given point x, this is the mean among v in the subdifferential of e at x of the norm of v. It's a generic part. It's not hard to prove, okay? Just by definition. This means in particular that if this guy is empty, this is plus infinity, according to the usual uh, you know, convention that wants that the mean or the inf of an empty set is plus infinity, okay? So in our case, in our case, this means that the slope of the Chigar energy, let's say that we are in the infinitesimal Hilbertian uh, setting, so the, the Chigar energy is quadratic. So in particular, there is only, if the subdifferential is not empty, it contains only one guy, this is the same as the L2 norm of the Laplace norm. Okay. Why am I, am I pointing this out? Because I have a priori estimates on the on this slope on this slope of a, of a convex of a convex function, and so I have a priori estimates on on Laplacian. So what I had what I get is that the Laplacian, if you uh, something that is constant time t squared. Uh, okay, there was this slope of. Now let me interpret it this way. This guy squared. This is less or equal than uh, um, I guess. I guess the L two norm of it for some constant c that depends on nothing. This is true. This is true for any for any infinitesimal um, uh, Hilbertian space, right? What, what does this come from? So I had an equality of the form uh, that was something like uh, numerical constant distance squared x t y plus another numerical constant divided by t, uh, no, multiplied by t, sorry, t times numerical constant times the energy of xt minus the energy of, of this point y plus another numerical constant t squared, or anyway, something that goes like t squared, slope of the function squared at xt, this was bounded by the square distance between x naught and y. So this was you remember now peak uh, energy oh sorry that's embarrassing yeah uh peak the energy um sorry okay um peak the energy the chicken energy peak y the zero function uh it has no energy um, so on the right hand side, you get the square norm of f. Forget about this, forget about this. Here you have t squared slope squared, but the slope squared is the norm of the Laplace, and you get it. Um, very well. And uh, okay, so that's the first thing that, that's an ingredient. Another ingredient is the closure of the Laplace that I want to use. So closure of the Laplacian means this. Suppose that Fn converges in L2 to some function f, and suppose that these Fn's have a Laplacian and this Laplacian converges in L2 to some function g, then f has the Laplacian, and uh, uh, the Laplacian of f is exactly g. That's the definition of, of being of being a closed operator. Uh, let me prove this. So first of all, let me prove that f is Sobolev. And how do I prove that f is Sobolev? That basically, you know, the, the, the simplest instance of Kachopol inequality was the energy of Fn. The energy of Fn is, uh, up to a sign, is uh, uh, Fn Laplace of Fn. But this converges in L2. This converges in L2, so this guy, you know, remains bounded in it. And if this remains bounded, converges in L2 by semi-continuity of the energy, the energy of F is bounded. Okay? So at least F has, is in W12. Now let's prove that it has a Laplace and the Laplace is exactly, is exactly G. What does it mean, this, this, this property? It means, so I want to prove that for every 
h in w12 i do have that uh, you know minus the integral grad f grad h is equal to the integral of uh, g h right well in fact i don't need to prove this for any h in w12 it is sufficient to prove this for a dense subset in w12 because then i mean both sides of these identities are continuous with respect to the W1 to norm. So I can just prove this for a for a dense subset. Which dense subset I pick? Well, I pick the domain of the Laplace, which I know to which which I know uh, is dense, for instance, because of this of, of these a priori estimates. Right? Well, but if H is the domain of the Laplace, then, then I can integrate by parsing here. And this is the integral of H of sorry, um, F Laplace and H. Right. So this is what I want to prove. And what it is that I know? Well, for any H in the domain of the plus, and I can run the same computation for Fn. And what I know is that the integral of Fn Laplace and H is the same as the integral of Laplace and Fn H. In fact, I proved that the Laplace was self-adjoint exactly. Right? But now these guys, Fn converges to F. So these guys converge to in L2. And the Laplace of H is in L2, no? And and also H is in it too. So this guy converges to GH. So end of the problem. All right. So why uh, why do I care about this? Um, let me remember. Uh, um, I don't remember. Let me see. Um, uh, Matthias, help me. Why, why did I prove this? There was a reason. Um, could you help me closing this? Uh, I wanted to. Um, there was a silly reason out of this, how to conclude. Once I prove the. Um, I think the equality of the left Yeah, so, but I want, so I want to send t go to zero here. Ah, okay, yeah. So, so this, so deep, but I, yes. So if I send t go to zero here, yeah, thanks. So, but the a priori estimates, thanks. Yeah, yeah that's the point. Thank you. So, S is po strictly positive, otherwise I don't have to prove that. I mean, there's nothing. So S, S is strictly positive. Therefore, H T plus S of F has a Laplacian for any T positive, and all these Laplacians are uniformly bounded, right? Now, send pick Tn going to zero. Take the Laplacians of these guys. These are two subsequences. They must converge weakly somewhere. Oh, sorry, here is uh, weak convergence is sufficient. The operator is linear, so you know being strongly closed is the same as being weakly closed anyway. So now the Laplacian of H T N plus S F they have they have, they have uniformly bounded norm. So up to subsequences, they must converge somewhere weakly in L2. But by the closure property of the Laplacian, what I deduce is that is that in fact H S of F has a Laplacian and the Laplacian of H S of F. Is exactly equal to this guy G. This we converge. Okay. So when I send the T and this and this now is independent on the on the sequence chosen because the, the limit is identified, right? So when I send T to zero here, this converges to the Laplacian of H S F. And when I send, wait a second. Um, I wanted to send T goes to zero even here on the right hand side. Oh yes. Um, Yes, here I want to use here I use the fact I use the fact that this uh, this slope on a, uh, along a gradient flow is decreasing. Remember, and if the slope is decreasing, and our slope coincides with the with the norm of the Laplacian, the norm of the Laplacian is decreasing. Okay, so if I assume that half as a Laplacian. And that was the assumption that to exchange the Laplacian with the heat flow. If I assume that F is a Laplacian, it means that F has a finite slope. It means that for any positive S or positive T, uh, HTF has a slope smaller than the one of, of, uh, of F. And so the normal Laplacian is smaller than, than the one of the original one. So now these Laplacians, forget about S, these Laplacians are uniformly bounded in L2. And any weak limit by closure when uh, when t goes to zero must coincide with the Laplacian of f, right? 
Make sense, Vitali? You know, by you know the inter the average interval from zero to t of Laplace of HSF the S. Right? But now if the Laplacian is a closed operator by Hille, you see that you can bring it out the integral by Hille theorem, not Hille, you see that. Um, and now this, uh, this, uh, this is converging, uh, this uh, HSF is converging to F. The, you have these uniform bounds on, on, the, on, the, on the norms of, of the Laplacian of HSF. So this converges, so this guy is converging to the Laplacian of F. Right? As soon as F has a Laplacian in N2, right? And one, so so what, what 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 I'm proving here is that if S, if F has a Laplace in L2, then this incremental ratio converges, this, this difference quotient converges to the Laplace of F. But now I'm done because because if I know this, if I know this, it's really just a matter of writing, you know, H S plus T F minus H S F divided by T. You have on, on one side, depending on how you decouple this, on one side this goes to the Laplace. Of HSF, and you know, on the other hand, it goes to HS Laplace of F. According to whether you you in some sense you take HS out of the fraction or not. Make sense, Vitali? No. So so this can be written, you know, uh, this can also be written as HS of HTF minus F divided by T. And now this converges to this. As t goes to zero. All right. And as weekend, and see you on Monday.